Well guys, all that moto camping and bike dropping has finally done my TWN. It appears I've cracked the rear of my frame. And it kind of makes sense too because all of the weight from my rack bears down right there. And as you can tell, the metal on the bike is definitely a lot thinner than the metal on the rack. But anyways, I'm a DIY kind of person, so I got a bunch of stuff over here and I'm gonna learn how to weld. And the thing is, I have less than a week before I go on a three day camping and riding trip with my friends to Taylor Park. So let's go ahead and get this started. I'll be honest, I have very little experience with welding, but this won't be my first time ever because I got a cheap Harbor Freight 90 amp welder years ago, but I only messed around with it for a few weeks, then it just sat in the shed until now. It's crazy how much more motivated you become to learn a new skill when you actually really need it for something. I decided to go ahead and upgrade to something a bit nicer, so I got this Titanium Flux 125 which was also from Harbor Freight, but they have come a long ways over the years, plus this machine had great reviews everywhere I looked. These are both flux core arc welders, so they basically use a spool of wire that is continuously fed through a gun while an electric arc melts it into the base metal. It's very similar to MIG, except there is no shielding gas. There is a flux material in the middle of the wire, and when melted, it protects and cleans the molten metal as it cools. The TW200 frame is made of a regular type of steel, so it's a good candidate for flux core welding. Other materials like aluminum or chromoly take a lot more skill and better equipment to weld. The upside to this type of welding is that it's cheaper because you don't have to buy the shielding gas and you can weld outside in a breeze unlike MIG. The downside to flux core is that it's a much dirtier process where it creates a lot of smoke and you have to clean the slag off after each weld you make. The main reason I upgraded to this new welder other than the higher amp rating is because it uses DC electrode negative versus the old one which is AC. DC negative is what's best for flux core welding because it's easier to work with and it can potentially produce cleaner welds. This one also has a voltage control knob so you can make finer adjustments versus just having a min to max switch. It's also about half the size so it doesn't take up as much room. Oh and also it has a proper flux core nozzle where the old one had a gas nozzle which made no sense. The Titanium Flux 125 comes with some instructions, a quick reference sheet, a strap, a small roll of flux core wire, some extra nozzles, and a second contact tip. To make learning how to weld a bit easier, I also picked up a welding table. It took some time to put together, but it's very sturdy and folds up flat. I also attached a small swivel vise in the corner, which could really come in handy. Some important metalworking tools you're gonna want to have is a drill with drill bits, an angle grinder with multiple attachments like cutoff wheels, wire brushes, grinding wheels, and stuff like that. There's also some welding pliers and a slag hammer which is also nice to have. A few other things that will come in handy is some better quality wire, extra copper tips, some tip dip, welding magnets, C-clamps, metal thickness gauge, and a metal marker. Safety is my number one goal when welding, so I'm gonna be using a sweatshirt I don't mind getting dirty, a respirator, an auto darkening welding helmet, and welding gloves. All right, now I'm ready to set up the welder. The instructions is gonna be a good place to start, and if you open the lid, all the important things to set it up are right there as well. I'll be using some Blue Demon 030 wire because it had some pretty good reviews, and I'm not sure if it's true or not, but a lot of people say the sample wire that comes with these machines is not really the best. To install it, I'll remove the nut, spring, and top plate. Then I'll release the wire from the spool while holding it to keep it from unwinding because it will create a huge mess if you let it go. Then I'll stick it on the spindle so it points straight towards the feed assembly like this. Install the top plate and spring, then tighten the nut just enough so it's still easy to move but it doesn't cause the spool to unwind all while still holding the wire. Next go ahead and snip off the mangled end of the wire and open the feed tensioner. Make sure the roller has the .030 on the upside and then feed the wire through the first feed guide. I did have trouble getting it through, so I removed the feed guide, fit it over the 
the wire and stuck it back in. Next, get it started through the second feed guide and while making sure it fits in the groove of the roller, I'll close the tensioner. I'll plug the machine in and turn it on. This one is nice because it has a cold feed switch that pushes the wire through at full speed without the electrode being activated. With the electrode tip removed, feed it through until it comes out the gun. Then install the O3O tip and nozzle. Turn the wire feed tension knob clockwise until the wire will bend at a 2 to 3 inch stick out. It really doesn't need much tension and you don't want to overdo it or it could crush the wire and cause issues. Before I weld my precious bike, I'm gonna want to practice first. I just picked up some metal stock at the local hardware store and also be sure to stay away from the zinc plated kind because it creates some very toxic smoke when welded. I'll be practicing on some 16 gauge sheet metal because it's a similar size to the cracked cross member on my bike. I'll attach it to the table with the C-clamps and connect the ground clamp to the workpiece. Connecting the ground to the table works in most cases as well. You just want a solid connection for electrons to flow. Also, I'll use a wire brush on an angle grinder to clean off the mill scale on the workpiece where I'll be welding. The cleaner the metal is, the better it will weld. Next, I'll cut the extra wire off so there's about a quarter inch sticking out and practice moving the gun. They say if there's slag, you drag. If you're welding something flat, you want to be aiming straight down with an angle of about 15 degrees in the direction you're traveling. This welder also recommends less than one half inch stick out. For the settings, it's good to start with the graph under the lid. I'm using .030 wire, so I'll go over to 16 gauge and it recommends a wire speed of 4 and a voltage of C to C.5, so I'll set my knobs accordingly. I'll go ahead and dip the tip in some of that blue stuff and this just keeps any weld spatter from sticking to the electrode. And now it's finally time to weld. I laid down my first two beads, and when using flux core, the welds will look horrible at first. That's because the flux creates a slag coating that protects the molten metal as it cools, like I talked about earlier. You can chip off the slag and use a hand wire brush to clean it off, but I found the brush on my angle grinder works the best to quickly make it all shiny again. It doesn't look too great, and the second one I burned a hole through, but that's what practice is for. After much more practice by experimenting with the dials and how I move the gun, this is what I came up with. I made many holes, but I learned that I need to move a bit faster and I figured out how far I can go without melting through. This one right here looks to be the best one I did. Next, I'll use a cutoff wheel on my angle grinder and cut two pieces. Then welded them back together as a butt joint, which is basically how I'm going to be welding the crack on my bike. I'll just do a little at a time, and it's a good habit to clean the slag off and clip the end of the wire after each weld you make. The wire can ball up at the end and cause issues with starting an arc, so it's nice to have fresh clean wire to start with. So here is what I ended up with. It's not perfect, but it's not too bad. Welding, grilling, and riding. That's uh, pretty much gonna sum up this week. All right, now it's time to take the bike apart. I'll start by removing two 10 millimeter bolts from under the seat and it just pops up in the back and slides off. Two more to remove the rack. I'll remove the zip ties and disconnect my tail light connector. I actually wired in this three pin waterproof connector as an upgrade to the original barrel style connectors. Now that I'm learning how to weld, I may make a video on this along with how to make your own custom LED tail light and plate bracket. Let me know if that's something you would like to see someday. While I'm here, I'll go ahead and remove the zip ties that are holding up the turn signal wires. Four more 10 mil bolts in the tail light bracket can be removed. After that, the rear fender unclips from each side and then it just lifts right off. I'll pull back the electrical tape and disconnect the connectors for my turn signals. These are also aftermarket connectors that I installed to make it easier to replace or remove them. I'll pull the harness back and remove four more 10 mil bolts and the subframe can be lifted off. Remove this 10 mm bolt, then there's a 13 mm for the muffler and the exhaust slides right out to the rear. Also keep in mind it will be a bit different if you still have the stock exhaust. Next use an 8 mm wrench to remove the battery terminals. Always remove the ground first and install the ground last or you risk shorting out the battery with the wrench since the frame is grounded. Squeeze and push back the clamps so the upper part of the fuel hose can be removed. I'll cover both sides with plastic baggies and rubber bands. This is to keep dirt from falling in. 
Remove the two Phillips screws for the left side cover and it rotates down and pops off the tank. The right side pulls off two grommets and rotates down and just pops off as well. Next, remove another 10mm for the tank, pull off the bracket and the rubber bushing, then the tank will lift up in the rear and it just slides off. I'll need a good ground when welding, so I'll use a wire wheel on a drill to remove the paint on the top and bottom of this little subframe bracket. So here is what the cracks look like. Wasn't too far from breaking all the way through. To get all the paint off, I'll start with a big wire brush and get as much as I can off and then I'll switch to a smaller wire wheel on a drill to get into the recessed area on the side. I'll get as much as I can on the bottom with that, then I'll switch to a Dremel with a tiny wire wheel to really get the rest off around the nut. Oh, that looks pretty good, nice and shiny metal to weld on. Alright, now I'll use the smallest drill bit I have to drill out the ends of the cracks. Be sure to look close and maybe go slightly further than you can visually see the end of it. The reason I'm doing this is to relieve the stress and prevent the crack from spreading. The best way to think of this is a chip bag that just got a tear in it. Everybody knows how easy it is for those tears to spread and if you were to put a piece of tape at the end of the crack, the tear will still be able to spread under stress. But if you were to cut a small hole at the end of the crack, it will no longer want to spread and you can tape up the tear successfully. Whoops, I broke a drill bit, so be careful with the small ones, I'll just use the next size up which is also really small. Once that's all the way through, I'll drill out the other one. I don't really need to drill out the one in the middle because that crack is torn all the way through. Next, I'll just clean the metal with some acetone and a paper towel. You want to avoid things like brake cleaner, especially the chlorinated kind because the residue it leaves can create phosphine gas when welded which can kill you or make you very ill. I'll put a video in the upper right hand corner from a pro welder who talks more about this. All right, it's time to roll the bike outside and put my welding gear on. I didn't use the respirator when practicing, but I'll for sure use it when welding the bike because who knows what kind of stuff is put in the air when welding near paint. Plus I found the flux smoke in general seems to irritate my lungs. I covered the bike in a fiberglass welding blanket to protect it from any spatter and connected the ground clamp. I also clamped the end of the open crack with some vice grips to hold it flat and prevent it from warping as I weld. I'm going to fill the first hole so I held the gun at about a 45 degree angle and first I didn't really get it but I got it on the second try and this is what it looks like. From there I'll just run a bead to meet up with the middle crack. Then I'll fill the second hole and I was able to get it on the first try this time. Then I just ran a bead over where I filled the hole. Just like I showed in the practice session, I'm cleaning the slag off and clipping the wire after each weld. I also did an extra pass on top of some of what I already welded to make sure everything got filled in. Now I'll just weld over the middle crack. To finish it off, I'll just add a bunch of welds at the end to keep it from tearing again. Alright, I'm all done up top, so now I'll just lay the bike down and recover it with the blanket. Welding vertical and in a tight position proved to be much more difficult and didn't look nearly as good as the top, but I got some good penetration into that nut. Next, I used a grinding wheel on my angle grinder to carefully grind down the top welds just enough so the rack will be able to sit flat. I didn't want to remove any of the actual cross member. I went ahead and ran a tap through the nut to clean up the threads. Then I just cleaned up the frame and used some painting prep spray. I masked the area off and sprayed about three coats of this perfect match galaxy silver metallic. It turned out to be a bit shinier than the original color and they had a duller silver available which would have probably been perfect but this still looks pretty good. Then I just reassembled the bike in reverse order, and with no time to spare, I put together my new hitch carrier when I was half asleep, then I loaded the T-dubs up and headed out to Taylor Park to put my new weld repair to the test.
Alright, I'm back here in the garage. I got everything torn down again and it's looking pretty good. You can kind of see where uh, I didn't grind the welds all the way down because I didn't want to lose too much material, but I don't see any cracks up here or down below. However, I didn't try it with all my moto camping gear. I just had my tool kit and all the stuff I carry with me on a day trip, but only time will tell to see how long it lasts and you never know, it could last for a year or two before it cracks again. Um, I do have the little crack on the other side. I need to fix that pretty soon before it gets any worse. But if it gets to the point where it just breaks all the time, what I'm gonna do is take a 1 8 inch steel flat bar and I'm gonna bend that all the way around here. And then I'm gonna make cutouts for those little nuts on the bottom so it just slides underneath into that channel and then weld the nuts to the flat bar and then the flat bar to each side of the frame. Or it might be easier if I just build it up little by little by taking a, a little piece of flat bar that I weld to the frame and then to the nut and then another piece of flat bar that goes from that nut to the other nut and then that nut back to the frame. But yeah, either one of those is definitely gonna make it a lot stronger but anyways, I have to weld other parts like my exhaust bracket. Um, that's completely torn off and then also my frame next to my right foot peg is starting to crack So I'm gonna have to take a bunch of stuff apart to get to that But I'm gonna go ahead and get to work because I want to go riding again I, I really miss riding but anyways, I hope you guys found this video useful and I will see you later peace